Why did you become a flyer? I, I was in, interested in aviation. It was ever since I'd seen an airplane. And I uh, joined the Army Air Corps because I knew that's where I wanted to be. How old were you when you enlisted? And, and I was 19 when I enlisted and 20 on the raid. There were four of us were 20 on the, on the raid. You were the youngest? No, there was one. At least one was younger than I was. Yeah. Okay. And uh, signed up in Billings on December the 2nd, 1940. Came to Fort Missoula and was sworn in here on the 3rd, a year and four days before Pearl Harbor. What went through your mind when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Where was Pearl Harbor? Did you know it was a part of the U.S.? Yes. Okay. So tell me, what was it like um, when you, even though you didn't necessarily know where Pearl Harbor was or what that meant, what was it for you when you, when you heard that for the first time that the U.S. had been attacked by the Japanese? Well, the U.S. found out in a very short time where it was. You made it your mission to figure out what was going on mm. with the war and, and what happened with Pearl Harbor? Yes. Right. Why did you volunteer for the Tokyo mission when you knew nothing about the mission mm. and what was involved? I had no idea that was, the, that was where we were going. Uh, what were you told when you, when you signed on? They needed volunteers for a special mission. I was a mechanic on the ground, and I wanted to do some flying, so I was able to get on that crew. Um, <clears throat> out of curiosity, why, how did they end up asking for people here out of Missoula as opposed to the rest of the country? Or did they ask uh, around the country? And they, uh, the 95th Bomb Squadron, the 17th Bomb Group, was the first group in the Army Air Corps to begin training in B-25s. They had more experience, so all of the Raiders were picked out of that bomb group. Okay. Um, what was your first impression of Jimmy Doolittle? Well, he was one of the shortest guys on the raid. He was very intelligent. He was, knew what he was doing. He not only knew how to fly, but he also knew everything about the airplanes that we were flying. At Eglin Field, Florida, we did very intensive training so they could be, be prepared to take off an aircraft carrier in, a, in a, that very short distance. And tell me, what was that like? What were some of the things that you guys had to do on a daily basis in order to make all that work? They took all the weight off the airplane we possibly could. The bottom turret was removed because we would be flying so low that no any f enemy fighter could get underneath of us. And, th and they put a 60-gallon tank in where that bottom turret was. Above the, in, in the bomb bay, in the top of the bomb bay, they also put a, a a tank that held over 100 gallons of gasoline, and we still had room for four 500-pound bombs. There's a crawlway between the top of the bomb bay and the top of the airplane, just enough room to crawl through there. They put a collapsible rubber tank in there, held way over 100 gallons, and they uh, used the gasoline out of there after we left Japan. And it was when they transferred all the gasoline out of that tank, then I was able to roll that tank to one side, so then I could crawl through there to the, get up to the front of the airplane. Before I got up in the airplane, they handed me uh, a dozen five-gallon cans of gasoline so that they used the gasoline out of the turret tank first, and then I was able to uh, dump those cans of gasoline into the turret tank and used a crash axe to cut a hole in each end of those empty cans, threw them out the window, I did that so they would sink immediately instead of leaving a trail from where we'd come. 
life on the carrier was quite interesting. We were on there. For, we left San Francisco the second of April, 40, 1942, and uh, in a small task force with uh, the Enterprise, the air carrier we were on, and then they had two cruisers and four destroyers and a, and a tanker in that small convoy. And then uh, about the 13th of April, we met up with another task force. It had the carrier Enterprise with it, also the same number of ships. So there's 16, air, 16 ships in the, in, the, in the task force then. The, eight, the 18th of April, uh, run, run into a Japanese picket ship out there, and we were afraid that they had radioed to Japan that the task force out there. So we had to take off immediately. And we found out later that the Japanese picket ship, before it was sunk, had radioed to Japan, that was the task force there. But the Japanese knew there was no U.S. aircraft off a carrier could uh, fly that far and return to the carrier. So they weren't prepared for us. How did you end up in the crew that you were assigned to? Was there any particular the, the, rhyme or reason? I, 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 I think probably the pilot picked the crew. I'm not, I'm not sure how it happened to be that crew. Okay. What did you think of your crew? I guess when you started working together as a crew, what did you think of those guys? And the crew got along very well. There was five men on each crew, a pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, and engineer, gunner. And so tell me, when, uh, when you guys started working together, was there a lot of... Um, was there a lot of tension? Was there a lot of stress at all because mm -hmm. of the, the anticipation of what was happening and the, the, all of the training that was happening? Or was it you guys were all on the same mission yeah. and you guys immediately clicked and it was just... There was no tension in our crew and I don't think any of the other crews too. We were so busy that we didn't, it wasn't time for any tension. And you, you had said that you got along with the crew well. How close did you end up becoming to your crew? Quite close. We became quite close before the, during the time of training, and we've kept close ever since the, the, that time through the reunions every year. Okay. Um, and particularly now, um, Everyone from your plane is now gone, right? Yes. You're the last one from your mm -hmm. plane. What? Uh, um, tell me specifically within your plane. How long? Did, how well did you guys get along? What was the? Um, I don't know. Did you guys have a special connection? Did you feel to mm -hmm. any any particular one of those guys, or before or after? No, we were a well uh, adjusted crew. Yeah. Um, when your B-25 was ready to take off from the Hornet on April 18th, how nervous were you? Didn't have time. I didn't have time to be nervous. We we're so concentrated on what we were doing. <laughs> and what was the the duck? The ruptured, ruptured duck. Ruptured duck. Yeah. That was the name of your plane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did it get its name? Oh, one of the crews was uh, out. Uh, on the ramp and drew a picture of Donald Duck sort of with crutches and sort of bandaged up on the side with, in chalk. Well, it wasn't long till the other crews named it that. <laughs> they, they call it what? The ruptured duck. <laughs> um, so tell me, uh, tell me about takeoff. Tell me about taking off of the carrier because um, you were seventh in line. Number seven, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So tell me, um, tell me about the flaps and and that whole situation. I I had no idea the flaps weren't down. <laughs> it looked like a normal takeoff to me. I was in a turret when it took off, so I didn't. <laughs> you didn't feel like you dropped didn't, off the end of the plane. I or didn't anything? notice. <laughs> uh -uh. Huh. Um. Tell me the story, anyways. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's been recorded by by some of the other guys, but tell me the story of of the takeoff and what happened with the flaps. Hmm. Well, the story I heard was the pilot was 
He's <coughs> running the engine so hard he's going to he's afraid he's going to blow the flaps off because they have to have full power before they even release the brake. So that's what he did. I got raised the flaps and and forgot to put them down. And, and so you guys kind of bombed, or yeah, kind of dropped off got, the drop out of sight. Yeah, huh. off the deck. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever talk to anyone later from the carrier and and or even here on the radio? Did they oh. wonder what happened to you guys for a second? Or no, not we didn't. Uh, the rest of the crews probably didn't even know to, know what what happened until yeah. later in the war. And it came, uh, it came as a real surprise to you guys when that uh, Japanese ship was out there and saw you guys, right? Yes, it was. Uh, well, the U.S. kind of expected something like that to be out there, and, and they had uh, picket ships scattered about 650 miles in Japan just to, for that purpose. Okay. Um, can you give me a little bit of the sense of the anticipation or the excitement as, I don't know if there were sirens on the ship that went off that alerted everybody no. that you needed to get to your planes or what happened? No, they just announced over the loudspeaker, pilots, man your planes. So that, that's when we had to get ready to go. And did it, what time of day was that? Around nine o'clock, it was about nine o'clock in the morning okay. on the April 18th. Do you remember exactly what you were doing at that time? Down below, de uh, down below deck when, uh, when they announced that over a loudspeaker and then, uh, and had a very short time to pack our bags and, and get up on a, on a flight deck. When you finally saw Japan, what did you think? And were you able to see the land from where you were at? I was in a turret on top. I could see everything from up there. Okay. So tell me what okay. what went through your mind when you saw Japan? Uh, when we took off, it was very rough weather. But when we reached Japan, the, the weather cleared up. Sun was shining and just a, a beautiful day. There, it was Saturday, right about noon, and there were quite a few people on the beach. And as we when overhead, they were w waving to us. We were flying so low, I could see the expressions on their faces. They were cheering. But we were over their heads and gone before they could see the uh, Army Air Corps insignia on the bottom of the right wing and on both sides of the airplane. Uh, of course, we were flying about 50 feet off the ground. That's what uh, altitude we came in over the ocean too, so I had to come to a, a hill or something, I had to go, go up over that and then over trees, so I had to back down as close to the ground as we could get. Between the coast then and, and before we reached Tokyo, uh, a formation of six airplanes met us, but there were they were flying so low they they didn't I'm sure they didn't see us. They just kept on going the direction they were going. That's the only other air, uh enemy plane that we saw. As we approached Tokyo, then we had to climb to one thousand five hundred feet to so the, the, when our bombs went off they wouldn't blow us out of the air. And there was a, quite a bit of anti-aircraft fire over the city when it reached there, but it wasn't accurate. Our target was this Nippon Steel Factory in Tokyo. We dropped our four bombs on that and then uh, headed for Tokyo Bay and got out of there as soon as we could. And then we followed the coast of Japan, not over land, but uh, on, over the ocean all the way to the southern tip of Japan, and then turned west to China. Talk, tell me a little bit about crashing off the coast mm. of China and mm. landing in the water. Well, it was nearly dark and, and raining, and the pilot spotted a strip of beach that he thought he could set the airplane down on, but, but uh, I don't know if he misjudged it. I think he misjudged the distance because it was pretty dark. and, and so we hit the water with our wheels down, immediately 
turned us upside down. The other four of the crew were thrown out through the nose of the airplane. I was in the back. I was knocked unconscious for a while. Finally realized that the, there was water coming in what I thought was the bottom of the airplane. So I tried to get out there, but then realized it was upside down and the plexiglass on a turret had shattered so that that's where the water was coming in. So I was able to work my back to the bottom of escape hatch and open that and get out on the bottom of the airplane. And I stepped off the tail of the airplane then it was, uh, water was about waist deep. By that time the other four of the crew had gotten up onto the beach. The first thing we saw was a, a few people up on the, on the bank there and they, and they must have heard the cries because they come down from their couple of buildings there and they finally come down to where we were and the first thing they wanted to know, we couldn't understand them and they couldn't understand us, but they pointed to their hand and pointed to, uh, pointed at one finger and then pointed at one of us and then uh, after five then they, we figured they wanted to know if there was any more of us in the airplane. We convinced them there was just the five of us. So they tried to help us uh, to get up on the bank and away from the airplane. Uh, so we stayed there overnight and uh, the pilot had a deep gash in his leg and a gash in his arm, and, and uh, co the co-pilot had a deep gash in his left arm. The navigator was kneeling between the pilot and co-pilot's armor-plated seats when he went out. The bombardier must have gone out through the nose of the airplane because the imprint of the, plec uh, the bracing on the plexiglass plexiglass nose was sort of imprinted on the top of his head and he was bleeding profusely. They got us up to there and, and uh, I was the only one that got out of the plane with a pistol belt on. I had one large bandage in my first aid kit and I used that to try to close the cut on a pilot's leg and then we had to use uh, probably handkerchiefs and I don't know what else, maybe undershirts to try and uh, bind up the gases on the other people's heads. I went out to the airplane about, uh, sometime about three o'clock in the morning probably, with a lantern and a couple of Chinese and tried to get to the airplane but the tide had come in, so I couldn't get to it then. Then at daylight, it went out again, and, and it, it was high and dry. Both the engines with propellers still attached were quite a ways from the airplane. Then I could see how much damage was done to the airplane. The whole front of the airplane pl with a pilot's compartment and a navigator and bombardier compartment were smashed flat back against the leading edge of the wing. So if they hadn't been thrown out, they'd have never got out alive. I went back to the, where the others were, the other fellows were about 11 o'clock and, and the gorilla leader on the, on the island there had fi uh, fixed, fixed up some stretchers, some pallets so they could carry them. The other four, because they couldn't walk then, and we left there at 11 o'clock that morning, and we found out later, about three o'clock, there were a company of Japanese soldiers landed right on that spot and came looking for us. But we'd already started across the island, so they, they never caught up to us. It took us most of the night and, and most of the next day to get across that island. It was a pretty good-sized island. And then, uh, the evening of the second day, we finally reached free territory in China, a small city there on, on the coast of Haiyu. And there we were met by a 
Chinese doctor that had come from a, a city of uh, Lin Hai that day to, to help us. So then that, that was the first medical attention we'd had for two days. By that time, gangrene had set in in a pilot's leg, so he eventually had to have it amputated at that hospital in China. The, th the third day then, we tr had to travel 25 miles to get th to that hospital, but just walking and being carried. and. The Chinese had blown up all the roads along the coast to slow the advance of the Japanese, so there were just trails through the rice paddies to get there. We were there three days, and a crew number 15 had made a good water landing on, on an island, near an island, out farther from the coast than we were. And the, and the guerrillas were operating on that island, too. So they got them, brought them to the island that we were on, and our co-pilot, uh, Dean Davenport, had given his passport to the guerrilla leader on the island. So they knew we were ahead of them and needed medical help. They had the only doctor that was on the raid on, uh, on that crew. He took training as a gunner so he could go on a crew. The plane floated for eight minutes, and they were able to get the life raft out and get all our equipment in the life raft. But in landing, a sharp edge of one of the flaps turned up, and as they pushed the life raft off the wing of the plane, that turned up flap snagged the raft and dumped everything in the water, deflated half the raft. So they were able to cling to the raft until they got to shore. <clears throat> and we were there another three days, and Doc White was on, was a, uh, he stayed with my crew, and I went on with the other four of crew number 15. Worked our way inland. It took us, uh, well, we traveled by sedan chair and every mode of transportation you can think of. Uh, most of the time, walking for day after day, finally got to where we were able to ride in a rickshaw all, all one morning. Then we got to the place, then looked across the draw there, and there was a, the automobiles waiting for us. Finally got the city of Hanyang. It's a huge city on the Yangtze River. And there, an airplane was supposed to come in from Chongqing to pick us up. For three days in a, uh, in a row, the air raid siren went off when we were eating breakfast. So we walked down to the dock, got on a, on a tug, went up the river a few miles, and the, the, the canyons and the rivers are got a very steep bank, so he just pulled up to the bank and let us out. And, Went up to there was a, about a six-story pagoda on top of the on the top of a hill there, and so we went up there and, and looked through that, and they were making storage batteries in the basement of it. The fourth morning, the airplane came in from Chongqing to pick us up. On well, that day, the Japanese came over and bombed and strafed that pagoda. They had spies through there. They knew what we were, had been doing. We finally reached Chongqing a, a month after the crash. So. There, Madam Chiang Kai-shek had a banquet for us. We met the Generalissimo. He could not speak English or understand it, but she could, because she went to school here in the United States. Then we flew from there. To, uh, were there about three days in Chongqing and then flew to uh, Kanmeng to refuel, and that's where the AVG, the American Volunteer Group, was, was stationed. And flew over the hump to Calcutta. Uh, it was during the dry season, and hazy and, and dusty, and, and we overshot Calcutta and landed in a big uh, plowed field. And Indians coming from all, all directions ran out there. The natives 
see what was the matter. So we finally talked to one, one old man. He said, told, told us where Calcutta was, what's your direction. So we took off and, and then landed at the airport at Calcutta. And we were the, I was there for 10 days and waiting for orders. I was there the last 10 days of May of 42. And then went to uh, New Delhi by train and, and then to Karachi by, flew there. And there I received my orders to come back to the United States. Uh, so we came on around the world from there. We, uh, from Karachi we flew to Basra, Iraq the first night and then Cairo the next night. And f France had surrendered by then so all of Northwest Africa was in, under German control. So we had to fly south to Khartoum and the Sudan and southwest across Africa to Liberia, to Nigeria first, and then Liberia, and then across the South Atlantic in a Pan American clipper. Took 12 hours of flight to uh, Brazil and South America, and then flew from there north to. San Juan, Puerto Rico, and, and uh, Miami. Um, how sure were you guys that you were on the coast of China? Well, we're sure because we, that's the only place there was the land. <laughs> now, you, you talked about um, how you got out of the airplane and, and got to shore. Did you recognize um, that everybody else was hurt pretty quick? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. they had, they were, I could tell they were hurt because they... Well, the the bombardier was just crawling around on his hands and knees, and and the others, well, very difficult for them to walk that evening. But they finally get up to the ha uh, the house there, and then after that, the next morning they couldn't walk; had to be carried. You know, after you after you drop the bombs and you you found mm -hmm. yourself coming into China, um, what went through your mind? Again, um, can you can you tell me, were you relieved? Did you feel like you were finally out of danger? Did you feel like you still had to keep going and keep going and keep going? What was your after reason? after we left uh, Japan? When we didn't know exactly, we put, I figured that we could make it all right. I figured we had enough gasoline to get there, but that was a, a quite a quite a ways. To, that we were in the air for thirteen hours that day, and that's a long ways for a medium bomber to fly. And so when you when you guys finally came into the coast of China mm. and you and you ended up on the coast, mm. did did you have a feeling of relief or did you did it even No, you? no, did, we didn't know what where, where we were going to land. Originally we thought we could reach the airfield in China that we planned to land at, but we we had to take off of 250 miles farther from China, from Japan, than we intended to, so that cut down on our fuel. And we were originally supposed to take off in the evening, bomb Japan at night, and reach China the next morning after daylight. Better not push forward by about 12 hours. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You took charge right away because you noticed everyone else was hurt. You kind of had to yeah. take charge of the situation. What? Um, I, was, I was not hurt very badly, just knocked unconscious for a while, but that's all I could, I could walk easily. Uh -huh. did, you, um, did you think you had those kind of leadership skills in you to grab your men and, and get done what needed to be done? No, you have to be prepared for most anything, but I wasn't prepared for something like that. Uh -huh. So what caused you to... To what drove you to do the, what you needed to do? I, I was the only one able to do that, to help them. And so you did it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You talked a little bit about the Chinese, and, and they questioned, you know, whether or not your, the crew was all there and you guys were okay. And then tell me a little bit more um, about how much they helped you. I know you said that the guys had to be carried at some point. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about specifically what the Chinese did that was very helpful. Well, if that wasn't for their help, we would have been captured by the Japanese because I had to be there to help them all, all the time to, to, as much as I could. And the Chinese, uh, we, 
It was the second day before we even got an interpreter to, to understand them. So just by pretty much by sign language, you had to communicate with them. Did they? Um they, they obviously understood the danger of the situation for you, that the Japanese were still coming and to try to find you. Yeah. Did they kind of help push you guys along, or were you the one that kind of instigated the movement? No, they, they had to do it, because I, I didn't know where we were going or anything like that. Okay. They were, uh, the Chinese treated us royally while we were there. We had done something that they hadn't been able to do for four years, fighting the Japanese. And that was to bomb the Japanese homeland. So they give us royal treatment. Even though they didn't have very much, they gave us the best. Yeah. Were you scared at all of mm. what the reaction would be from the Chinese or what the next step was going to be? No, I, I wasn't scared. I was just looking forward to getting to our destination. You won a silver star for the care you provided for your wounded flyers and for evading the Japanese. Tell me, what does that silver star mean to you? I guess I was awarded the silver star for taking care of the other members of the crew. I had to be prepared for something like that, but I, I didn't think it was necessary. Uh, you have to do what you have to do in a situation like that. Tell me what it was like to attend the reunions after the war. It was, after the war, we had the reunions all except for two years, ever since 1945. So it was great to see the other raiders through the years, see how they were doing, keep track of them. During At the reunions, we and got to see a lot of the country. It was they were in different cities every year, somewhere, and in, usually in the southern United States, where the weather was nice on the anniversary date, April eighteenth. We had about three reunions at Air Force Academy at Colorado Springs, Colorado. One of the reunions, they give us rides in in uh, gliders. And they'd have a biplane tow the glider up to 10,000 feet and then turn, turn it loose. And it was, there's no heat in them. It was very cold in the middle of April. <laughs> that, and my uh, wife and I both got to go with gliders. We, we were in the air at the same time and in different gliders. <laughs> and the pilots are uh, cadets. Did you get to go back to any of the, say, the beach where you landed in China, or? No, I never went back to China. Okay. So there are just three of you left of the original 80 Doolittle Raiders. So is that, is that something yeah. that makes you sad? What is that, mm -hmm. what goes through your mind when you realize there's just three of you left? Well, it's gotta end someday for all of us. The last one we lost was just in January. Uh, and. Uh, and he was the other guy from Montana. There was two of us from the state of Montana was on the raid. Ed Saylor, yeah. He was on crew number 15. He was engineer gunner, uh, engineer on crew 15. And he, he, uh, he, his crew was the one who walked part of the way across China with <laughs> Well, And uh, he came back to the United States when I did too. Did you guys keep up with each other then? Uh, during the reunions, yeah, we'd, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you've also been awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Tell me about that and what does that mean well, to you? That's just coming up. It's, a, it's, they got us through Congress, I guess, to award the Raiders the Congressional Gold Medal, yeah. It's going to be awarded in April, I guess, to the, and it will be on display at the uh, Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, permanently. Yeah. Um, do you feel like this is a long time coming, that these men needed mm -hmm. to be recognized that way, or how do you feel about it? I don't know. 
I don't think it was necessary. <laughs> Just doing your job? Yeah. When did you fully understand the impact that the Doolittle Raid had for America, what you guys did? The public was not uh, informed very much about the raid until one year afterwards, so it's a top secret then. They didn't tell where we took off from or where we landed. But since the, since the war has become more well known to the public, did people recognize you? Is that I, I guess I, I, I'm not sure as to how well known you were once that information was made public. Oh. Were you made public and did people recognize you or Well it was uh, through the book first at thirty seconds over Tokyo, I guess. And then they made the movie off out of that book. I was in North Africa when uh, MGM Studios wrote and asked if I if they could use my name in a movie. The, What'd you think about that? The fact that MGM wanted to make a movie about the two uh, little raiders. I hadn't even seen a book yet. I didn't know what it was like. <laughs> so now looking back at it, how how accurate was the movie? It was just fairly accurate. Uh, the book was quite accurate. Yeah, and but they had to put more. Romance in the movie, I guess, of Salt to Cell. All right. Did you get paired up with anybody? Any good-looking blonde in the movie? <laughs> no, I, when I came back from North Africa in January of 44, they were just finishing the movie. I was at Station of Santa Monica for a couple of weeks at R&R, and, &R and so got to go to the studios and meet all the crew there. So. And they later sh had the world premiere showing of it at Grumman's Chinese Theater. So I was able to go to that. You mentioned that your pilot lost his leg um, to amputation in China. How difficult was that on the rest of the crew, knowing that one of the crew lost a limb? Uh, uh, the hospital they were in, they finally had to move on because the Japanese kept advancing and they were going to eventually take over that city. So they had a kind of a rough time getting out of there. And the other three of the crew stayed there too, all four of them, until they were able to move. Yeah. So uh, after after the so when the crew got hurt and mm -hmm. he had to have his leg amputated, you were able to move on, and then the, the rest of yeah. the crew that were hurt stayed there in the hospital. I had I moved on with the crew number crew fifteen crew number fifteen okay. because I was no longer of any help there as long as the doctor White Doctor White was there. Okay. What happened after you got back to the United States and then how many you know went home to Billings for a couple of weeks furlough and then reported to McNeil Field to Tampa, Florida and began training in B twenty sixes. It's also a medium bomber, twin engine, but it's got a single tail, a double tail like a B-25. Trained down there for uh, until about 1st October, then went to New York by train and then boarded the Queen Mary and went to, to Scotland. And the Queen Mary went across the North Atlantic alone at the change course every three miles, turn 90 degrees, zigzagging across the North Atlantic. A, a submarine couldn't late and wait for it and it couldn't catch up to it. Off the coast of Ireland, a dozen U.S. and British just, uh, destroyers met us to escort us into Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, one destroyer cut across the front of the Queen Mary twice looking for submarines. The third time it didn't make it, the Queen Mary cut it in two. That accident was not reported to the public until after World War II was over. So we uh, disembarked at Glasgow and then went 
down to Norwich, England, that is east of London. We didn't have an, our, our airplanes there, so the, every night the German bombers would come over our base on their way to London, but they, they didn't bother us. Then uh, I, I was in the hospital for two weeks with malaria in a civilian hospital over there. In the meantime, my outfit had moved out on their way to North Africa, and I was attached to an engineer outfit and, and went by convoy then to North Africa. Landed there about the 1st of January of 43. And we were, uh, f uh, f uh, until April of 43, we were flying submarine patrol back and forth across the Mediterranean from Iran, Algeria to the coast of Spain moved up to the front in April, and we were, then we were bombing the Italians and Germans out of, out of North Africa. And, so, and we could reach the islands of Sicily and Sardinia in the Mediterranean and the southern half of Italy. And by, by July, uh, the Allies had captured Sicily so then we moved up to Tunisia, and from there we could bomb, uh, first bombing Sicily and Sardinia, and then uh, after the, uh, inv well, through invading Sicily, they had already uh, captured that. So we were bombing southern Italy. I was on 26 bombing missions over there, and including the first one on Rome. And then I got uh, uh, what they call yellow jaundice in about last of September, which is uh, hepatitis. And then I was in the hospital for two and a half months there, and, and uh, I didn't do any more flying after that. Finally came back to the United States in January of 44. And the rest of the war I was in Station California until July 45 when I was discharged. How soon did you find out how many of the original Raiders died on their mission um, and how many came N back? Not until after the war. And the, the ones that were captured, we didn't know if they were alive or dead. Uh, and they executed three of them and one died in prison. So, so you only, how many did you lose total then? Well, most of them went uh, uh, in combat again. About a dozen of them stayed in, Ch in China and, and they're flying down into Burma. And uh, three of them were killed in one day. Different airplanes are flying over the Himalayas and run into bad weather. And then another one was killed over there too. I, I don't know if that was all. Or, but it found out, well, mostly after the war, what happened to yeah. Okay. Number number eight crew, they knew before they reached Japan that they would, wouldn't have enough gasoline to reach China. So after they dropped their, dropped their bombs on Tokyo, they just gained altitude and went over the mainland of Japan and headed for Vladivostok, Russia. And that was the only one of the planes of the 16 that landed on its wheels. Russia wasn't too keen in being a part of this raid, right? No, they had to be interned because Japan, uh, Russia was not at war with Japan at the time. And they finally escaped through Iran and 14 months later. Hmm. And there was three more raiders were shot down and became prisoners of war of the Germans. And did they come, they came back home? Yeah, after the war. Uh, yeah. Do you think you're a hero? No. No. Can you tell me a little bit about those medals? As far as... The, the first one, one down in the, right here was ordered by Madame Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, Distinguished Flying Cross was ordered at Washington, D.C. at Bowling Field 
and when they came back, got back from China, there was about 20 of the Raiders there for that. And then the Silver Star was awarded after I got back to Billings by some military officer there. And the Air Medals were uh, for missions flown in North Africa. And then I see your discharge medal, which is the ruptured yeah. duck. Well, that's that's what they say now, but it, then it was a, an eagle trying to get out of a circle. 